Um, all right, so one of our nine ministry principles, and it's on the backs of your bulletin, uh, principle number three is we are a house of prayer. Um, for this church to, to survive, for us to be effective in the work of the ministry, um, we have to be a house of prayer. But that is only true. We can only be a house of prayer if we pray. Well, I'm not the smartest bulb or brightest bulb in the box, but you know, it's kind of hard to be a house of prayer if we don't pray. And we can't pray effectually if we don't understand prayer. So what we're doing right now, what we're starting to, to go through here is so we're trusting God to, to envision us to be a house of prayer, to, to teach us to pray. And uh, so we're starting, last Sunday, we started a, a series on prayer. And we're using the Lord's Prayer as our guide because it contains all the, the crucial elements of prayer all in one place. Um, it is, in a way, it's short and sweet. You know, Christ, we use the, the expression, keep it simple, stupid. Christ was the master of that. Rather than make something complicated and, and complex and, and drawn out, Christ could make something so simple, um, just short and sweet. And that's really the Lord's Prayer. It's, I think in our minds it needs to be complex and, and drawn out, but, but it's all right there. But before we get into this too far, um, last time we had given you a definition, and we want to we want to go back to that because this kind of is. Um, um, let me look. Okay. All right. Um, so our definition of prayer, what we're working off of here, is prayer is a believer's pleading with God through the person of Christ, assisted by the Holy Ghost. And if you kind of break this down a little bit. So it's a believer's pleading with God through the person of Christ, assisted by the Holy Ghost. And so we see in that that all parts of the Trinity are involved in, in true biblical prayer. Because we have to, it's us interacting with all of the Godhead, both. But it also has to be pleading. See, too many believers either aren't in prayer or they're powerless in prayer because they aren't in a place spiritually where they've become totally dependent on God. The only way to have power in your life is through prayer. And the only way to have power through prayer is to recognize that you are completely powerless. To get to the point where we have prevailing prayer, we have to come to the end of ourselves and in complete dependence, we have to seek God and plead in prayer. As long as there is a little bit of us left, if we're saying, God, just, just give me a little extra boost. God, just give me a little extra. I've almost got this, but God, I just need just a little bit of extra. Help. We're not there. And we're not going to get that power. As long as we're relying on ourselves, we have to come to that place where we are a complete and total dependence on God. For we're crying out to him. We're saying, God, I can't do this. You know, the Apostle Paul had the thorn in the flesh, and he, he besought God three times for to depart. And, and God tells him, but in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. And then Paul says, I would rather glory in my infirmity. We have to get to that place where we embrace our weakness. We embrace our nothingness. Because that's when God steps in, and that's when God works. That's when God gets the glory. But we have to get to that place where we recognize that it's not of ourselves. So last time we started off by looking at some cautions regarding prayer. Um, because there, there are things that can cancel out prayer. So before we... We get into prayer, and since we're following the model that Christ gave us in Scripture, Christ actually gives them some warnings before he teaches them to pray. So we're following that, and we're looking at some of those cautions. And one of the things that we saw is that we can have imitation prayer. You know, 
I don't know about y'all, but I, I never really have liked imitation stuff. You know, like the imitation bacon bits. Those things are just nasty. That's just wrong. And I mean, it, we use it sometimes because it's hard to find the real thing, but like the imitation vanilla, if you cook with it, it's just never quite right. Only imitation. But y'all, we can have imitation prayer. We can have fake prayer that parades as masquerades as the real deal. But it's not. It's an imitation. It's a, a parody. See, this prayer that may seem real, but for various reasons, it only sounds like prayer. It's, it's not really any different than like a fake prop from a movie or a play. You know, the movie, it looks real. That gun looks really cool. But it doesn't shoot bullets. I mean, maybe if somebody attacked you and you're using it for self-defense, you could club them with it, but some of those things are probably made out of plastic and then break. They're not real. They're fake. They're, they're a forgery. They're a copy. It may look like the real deal from the outside, but it's completely useless. And we can have prayer that's like that. It may look great. It may sound great. And everybody around may think, oh, man, that person's got the gift of prayer. Listen, man, their, their prayer is so eloquent. And all it is is just empty words floating in the air. So today we're going to continue with this, uh, this look at some of these cautions before we, we get into um, actually learning how to pray. Um, I don't think we'll we'll actually get into that today, but last time, and I apologize, y'all, I had no clue how long I went last time. I did not intend to go that long. So if y'all were getting restless and and uh, tired of sitting, I'm, I'm sorry for that. All right, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, and then we'll learn about prayer. Lord, we just come to you now, and we're so grateful and so thankful for this beautiful day that you've given us, for the, the beautiful sunshine to remind us of the, the true Son, the Son of Righteousness, your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're so grateful and so thankful for that, and we're so grateful for the gift of eternal life that you've given us through your Son, and, and Lord, we're so thankful for your Word to guide us in every aspect, and for your Holy Spirit to to teach us the word, to guide us into all truth. And Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to gather this morning, to, to spend time in fellowship, and to spend time in worship, and to spend time in your word. And Lord, we just pray now that as we're getting into the study of your word, Lord, we just pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would, that you would guide us into all truth. Because Lord, we know that without you, except <coughs> you build the house, Lord, we labor in vain. We have to have the Holy Spirit to guide us in the truth. Otherwise, your word is spiritual. And without that spiritual help, we can't receive it. We can't take in those deeper things. So, Lord, we just pray now that you would you would meet with us, that you would help us. And, Lord, I pray for me especially, that you would guide me, that you would speak for me, Lord, that you would just take me out of the way. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so today we're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. So good morning. Go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Uh, Jamie, I don't think I gave this to you. So. I apologize. We don't have. How dare you? <laughs> a lot to learn. Terrible, today. terrible, horrible. Not a lot to learn. Unforgivable. I didn't communicate this to Jamie until we don't have a slide. But All right, so Matthew chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. <clears throat> Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, 
for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Okay, so we're actually going to be picking up today, and I had to stop in the middle last time. Um, we're going to be picking up in verse 5 there. And, uh, yes. So last time we had talked about, um, we have a few assumptions, and we had only gotten through the first one, that the part of what this verse assumes, the, the first assumption that we covered, what we see here is, and when thou prayest. So there is an assumption that, remember that Christ is, is talking to his disciples here, to the twelve. And there is an assumption that they pray. And when thou prayest, it's not if you pray, it's not when you start praying, it's not if one day you pray, when thou prayest. So one of the things that we can take away from this is that a disciple of Jesus Christ prays. That's part of being a disciple. And that's part of what happens with discipleship as we go through that, that process. I don't want to say those lessons, but that process of discipleship, that biblical process of growing in God's word and part of what happens through that over the course of that is that the disciple becomes established in prayer. One of the four goals of discipleship that we have is to establish the believer in the worship of God. And prayer is part of worship. Worship is not limited to just the songs that we sing. We also worship God in prayer because uh, prayer, in prayer we praise God and we, bring, we glorify God. And so prayer is part and parcel of discipleship. We can't separate those two out. If we if we are truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, we pray. Um, but today we're going to be in, we're starting with our second assumption. And our second assumption is that we pray because we are really addressing God. And I struggled with the, the wording of this a little bit. Um, and honestly, I can't take credit for the wording of that. I, these are a set of notes that I was given and um, by some someone whose shoes I do not feel qualified to fill. Um, but I tried to take it and sort of make it my own, but I've left some of these points alone. And, and I know that maybe this doesn't totally make sense the first time I read through it. But another way that we can say this is we pray because we are we are truly addressing God. Um, th this isn't just saying words into the air. This is not just uh, the heathen where they're, I hate to say this, but we passed the Catholic Church this morning and you know they, they pray to the statues of the saints. And um, this isn't addressing an object. This is addressing the living God of the universe. That's why we pray, because we are addressing God. But this is an area where, where a lot of Christians struggle. Um, this, this idea of addressing God, because for one, we can't see God. And God is a spirit, so we don't see him. Jesus Christ was the physical manifestation of God when he was here on earth in his earthly body, but, but he is, of course, right now at the right hand of the Father, so we don't see God. We don't touch God. We don't with our physical senses. But God is a spirit. We worship him in spirit and in truth, and we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so we have a way to connect with him. It's just not something that when we're first saved, it's completely foreign to us because we've lived our whole life up to that point being spiritually dead and, and living and walking in our flesh. And so this is something that's totally new and we're not familiar with it. And then there's so many of us, even after the point that we get saved, we spend so long as a babe in Christ. Or maybe we've grown up to maybe be a little child. 
But we've never really grown and matured spiritually. And we walk in the flesh and, and we don't have an intimate relationship with God. And so we don't really know how to address him. You know, we... I remember where I put this in my notes. Um, we have the passage from, from Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. Or Nehemiah, yeah. This one. Um, we can see kind of a, a cool representation of this in Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, um, Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And I know you're you know, what in the world does Nehemiah have to do with prayer? Well, hopefully this will be clear. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him, and I, being Nehemiah, took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him the time. Of course, we know this. A lot of us are probably familiar with this passage. This is... Um, where Nehemiah, this is the beginning of Nehemiah being sent back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And we're all fairly familiar with that story when Nehemiah is building the walls and they're having to build with build with one hand and a sword in the other hand. Um, and it, it's a great picture of spiritual warfare. But the reason we're going to this this morning, see, so many times we, as Christians, we we lack an intimate relationship with God because we walk in the flesh. We don't walk in the spirit. We, Our focus is on the world. It's not on the things of God. We're not spending time in the word of God and we're not spending time in prayer. And, and so, yeah, we struggle with prayer. We struggle with, with being able to directly talk to God when we do pray because we don't do it. And so it's so foreign and so strange to us. And we wind up just saying words into the air instead of truly having this this close, intimate discussion with God. And one of the errors that we have to be careful of, we can go to one extreme before we never talk to God. And we just, it's so rare that we don't even know him. Or we go to the other extreme of, forgetting that he is God. And yes, he is our loving father. Don't forget that he is the God of the universe. He's not your best friend. He's not your bro. He's not whatever term you want to use. Jesus isn't my boyfriend. It's He is God. But what we can see here from Nehemiah we see this intimacy of the relationship. See, Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. And so Nehemiah was always in the presence of the king. It was his job to actually to make sure that the king wasn't poisoned to taste the wine before he would give it to the king. So every time the king wanted a drink, every time the king was thirsty, Nehemiah was there. So he had to stay close at hand. And so because of that, it gives him an opportunity to have a close, intimate relationship with the king. Yes, Nehemiah is in a a servant's position, just like we are a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. But there's this intimate relationship. They know each other well. The king knows Nehemiah so well that he sees Nehemiah's countenance as sad. 
the king cares for him and says, what's going on? And so this is the way our relationship with our king should be. He's still the king. We see there in verse 3, Nehemiah says, let the king live forever. He's, he's giving respect to the king. He's also intimately talking to him and sharing, pouring out his heart to the king when the king asks. So this is the relationship that we have to have with God in order to pray and really address God. So to get back to this, know that you are about to dress God when we, when we pray. Know that you are about to dress God. And although you can't see him, know that he is really there. If you can feel the reality of God's presence, it will put your mind in a humble state. If you can put yourself spiritually and mentally before the throne in heaven, at the foot of the throne, puts you in a state of humility when you realize that you are in the presence of God everywhere in scripture someone meets God what do they do they fall on their face that's what happens and it's that's not really even a voluntary reaction it's just his overwhelming glory down they go but that's what we have to we have to be before the throne, bow before the throne. And when you recognize that you're in the presence of God and you take your rightful position of humility, the next, the next thing you want to do, part of that humility, is that you recognize that you have absolutely no right to what you ask for. You know, we live historically, I mean, yeah, I guess we'd say historically, the the actually be the, the prophetic application of the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. We live in the, the Laodicean church age, the last age. The word Laodicea means the rights of the people. We live a, in a country that was founded on our rights. We have the Bill of Rights, and, and we're all about our rights. And man, if we don't, if we think our rights are infringed, we squall like mashed cats. And we pitch fits and we protest and we do all kinds of things. But realize that when we come before God, we have no rights. God does not owe us anything. And so when we come in prayer, God does not have to grant us anything because we somehow deserve it or we have a right to it. See, the, the act of our speaking does not obligate God's hearing. The act of our prayer doesn't require action on God's part. You've got to have that mindset, that humility. <laughs> if you call a prayer chain and you have the whole church praying, God's not more obligated to hear you because there's more voices. You can't count on your praying in itself. What you have to count on is God's grace. See, God honors our prayers because of who God is and because of Jesus Christ. Not because of who we are and because what we deserve or what our rights are. Because of who he is. It's because he is a God of mercy. He is a God of grace. You can't expect to get an answer except as a free gift due to you because it was won by Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And this brings us to our you have the verse, first point first. Ah, yes, so why pray? This is our first point for why we pray. It proves you have faith in God. Yep. 
It is our faith that activates the promises of God's word and the grace that we receive through Jesus Christ. Not because of who we are, what we deserve, how great we are, how many people we've got praying, anything else. Because of who God is, what his son Jesus Christ did, and we tap into that through our faith. James 2.20 tells us that faith without works is dead. It's a fairly familiar passage that we all know. Without our prayer is one of those, those outward signs that we have faith. If we lack faith, we lack prayer. And we lack prayer because we lack faith. So you don't prove your faith by saying you believe. We can say that we believe till we're blue in the face. I can say that I believe that there's little green men on Mars, or I can say that I believe that the sky is purple. That doesn't prove my faith. That's just saying words. Your faith is Hebrews 11.1. 1. Gives us the definition, the Bible's definition of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith requires action. If we want to go through the rest of chapter 11 of Hebrews, this is a passage that many will oftentimes call the, the hall of faith. And this goes through so many of the Old Testament saints. And there's some folks in there that you'd be awful surprised, given their life, and most of their testimony that they're in there, like Samson. We tend to say, well, anything that Samson did do the opposite because he is the worst example there is. Samson makes it into the hall of faith because he had just enough faith. Don't get me wrong. Don't don't copy Samson, please. Don't. Don't. <laughs> Bad idea. But Samson did have some faith. So if we were to go through the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, what we see is that all of these times when you see this pattern repeated by faith by faith by faith and it's by faith so and so did dot 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 it was by faith that they did an action the action didn't give them faith it was their faith that produced the action and for us our faith produces prayer if we believe that god is who he is who he says he is in his word. And if we believe that the way we access that, we, the way we access his promises is through prayer, if we have that faith, then the natural result is that we pray. Faith is proven by true prayer, which is addressing somebody you believe is really there. If we don't believe he's there, and it's not faith to really address it. We're just going through the motions. And we don't address him if we don't believe he's really there. That means if you're not a praying Christian, you're not a believing Christian. And I'll say this. We can all, and I know that that, that may kind of hurt. And maybe we've all gone through seasons in our life where we didn't pray. We start saying, well, Am I really saved? Well, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. Examine yourself. Know that you know that you know. We can know. I mean, our, our memory verse is that these things that I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, ye may know. We can know through the Holy Spirit. But we all go through seasons in our life. Remember, God is a spirit. In order to pray, we have to be in the spirit. And we go through seasons in our life where especially as we're, we're less mature in Christ. And we go through times in our life where, where we have quenched the Holy Spirit to the point that we are no longer in prayer. And so please don't, you know, don't take this, me saying that if you're not a praying Christian, you're not a believing Christian. It's very possible that you are a Christian who is, who is walking in the flesh, who has quenched the Spirit. Um, but we, if we are... If we are a disciple of Christ, if we are following after him, we've taken up our cross and we're 
or going after Christ, we will pray. And it may start out small, but we will pray and it will build. You know, faith being the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, one of the easiest examples that comes to my mind, especially living here in, in Southeast Wyoming, um, we got this thing. It's a really, I don't even know if I should say this in church. It's a four letter word. It, it starts with a W. Wind. Don't say it. Yeah, it, it's a bad word around here. Really? But <laughs> we, we have this wind thing. Oh, we can't see it. Okay. You know, we don't see the wind. But in our backyard, why it's got a, a weather gauge, a weather station, it's got a little spinny thing, measures the wind. Sometimes in some places we use a logging chain. <laughs> the weather station, the, the logging chain, it shows us the evidence that that unseen thing is there. That's the way our faith is. It shows, it's the evidence. Our faith is the evidence to the world around us. It's part of that there is this unseen, glorious God. So, I know we're actually going to go so fast. <laughs> we better start winding this down for today. Um, so you say that, okay, you know, I'm a praying Christian, and I pray, but God still doesn't hear. Well, you have to understand this. It's not just the fact of prayer that proves faith. You don't just pray one time, and, and that's it. And okay, God, I had faith, I prayed. All right. No, it's the perseverance in prayer that proves our faith. See, God doesn't make faith easy. God wants to try our faith. He wants to try us. He wants to, God knows our heart. It's not a test to see, for him to see if we have faith. It's for us to see. But God weeds out those that are not truly in. It's the same thing as in the work of the ministry and the mission. God weeds out those that aren't all in through the fiery trials. It's God's work is serious. It's the same thing with our faith and prayer. So it's the endurance of prayer. It's that you grab hold. And we remember the story of, of Jacob. And this is this is Jacob wrestling with God and not letting go until you get a blessing. And sometimes, yeah, you may walk away with a limp. If you truly want that blessing, if that's great enough, if, if your heart is so strong for God that you are willing to just grab a hold and hang on to cling desperately in prayer, there's a wonderful blessing waiting. So why does, so we can't really get into that, or we don't have time to get, this leads right into our next point. Um, oh, no? Okay. You're getting them excited. I'm, I'm trying to be more aware of time. So, and there's no clock I can look at. My watch is... Hard to look at that. You can't right. see time. You have to yeah. have faith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't see it. I know it's, it's taken away. <laughs> All right. So why does God do it this way? Why does God make us persevere? Well, God isn't a Scrooge with his blessings. He's not trying to delay or, or strain you out. He's not trying to make you quit. See, the reason that God delays, and this is point number three, um, the reason God delays is to either get you ready for the answer or the answer ready for you. See, oftentimes, we aren't always ready to handle the answer. We want an answer from God. But a lot of times, I can tell you this, I know in my life, when I was a younger Christian, when I was more concerned about my will than God's will, I would go to God in prayer and and not always get an answer, but it was because I was seeking God to, to give me my will. God wasn't ready for the answer. 
The answer was no, because that wasn't God's will. It was my will. But I wasn't ready for that no, because I was a spoiled only child. I, I, wanted, I wanted what I wanted, and I want it now. I looked at God as an ATM machine. He was just supposed to spit out whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. I wasn't ready for the answer. But God has to prepare us for the answer. That way, when, when we meet the answer, when the time comes, we're right where God, where God's providence needs us to be. To tap into that. So sometimes if the answer is yes, but if God hasn't answered it yet, it's because he needs to get you ready to deal with the yes. Sometimes if we truly come to God with an open heart and we're, we're truly seeking his will, yes may not be the answer we want. Yes may be difficult. Maybe we're praying about something that's going to require testing our faith, stretching us, trying us, taking us to a place that's uncomfortable. Earlier in the announcements, we we're talking about getting out and sharing the gospel. I can tell you all that for me, that's that's not necessarily a place that I'm comfortable. Actually, my parents are the real, well, Jamie and Steve, I mean, those, most people don't know, but I was really shy most of my life. And I still am to some extent. It wasn't until law school that I had to come, and I couldn't tell my client, I'm sorry, you're going to lose your case because I'm too shy to pick up, pick up the phone and make a phone call and talk to someone. But I still am uncomfortable making small talk to somebody I don't know. I, if it's a business, if I have a particular topic that I need to talk to this person about, that's great. But especially to just stop someone on the street and start talking to them about something that I know they may not want to hear about. It's not easy. That's, a, that's an uncomfortable thing. So I was asking y'all earlier to pray about signing up for this weekend. Well, that may be, yes, may not be the answer that some of you want. Because that may take you to a place that's uncomfortable. That may stretch you and push you a little bit. But sometimes God has to, to delay a little bit to get us ready for that yes. To prepare us, to strengthen us. But if the answer is no, but God still has an answer. It's because he knows you're not prepared to handle no yet. Sometimes the thing that we want, that we're praying about, we want it to be a yes. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a, a different position at work. Maybe it's moving to a different location for a new opportunity. Whatever the case may be, maybe it's a purchase. Maybe it's something, oh man, I really want this new cool shiny thing. And I've convinced myself that I can use this in ministry. I can justify this because I can use it in ministry. Maybe 10% of the time. The rest of the time it's for me. God, would you, God, would you please show me is this your way? We don't want to hear no. We want that shiny new toy. God has to get us ready. God has to prepare us get our heart to the point where it's aligned with his will. You have to keep praying so that God can change you. That way, by the time you hook up with the answer, the answer is always right. Perseverance in prayer is what prevails. So how long do you pray? That's easy. Until you get an answer. And why is that? So this is our second and our third points under why to pray. It proves your dependence on God. See, prayer is not really about us proving anything to God. Remember, it's about us proving things to ourselves. It's about us getting our heart right. It's us coming to God and, and pleading prayer is really about molding and shaping us. So it proves, number one, it proves our faith in God. Number two, it proves our dependence on God. 
Because if we're not dependent on him, we're not going to persevere. If we're relying on ourselves and we're just going through the act and going through the motion, we're not going to jump through the hoops that long. We're going to check that box and move on and then do it in our strength. So if we're doing it in the flesh, we may pray about it one time so that we can say that we prayed. Okay, yep, check that box. I can tell everybody, yep, I prayed about it. And now I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it on my own. God didn't answer that prayer, and so I'm just going to step in and do it. Now, true prayer proves that we have the perseverance in prayer, proves that we have dependence on God. Because if we are truly dependent, and we come to that place where we know that we can't do it ourselves, we know that we're powerless, we know that we are nothing, we know that we're nothing but a dirt bag. We are made out of dust, and we are nothing but a dirt bag. And we come to that place, we will continue to pray because that's our only choice. We can't do it. We gotta have an answer from him because we can't do it. And point number three, it provides your intimacy with God. Remember, Nehemiah was constantly in the presence of the king. That's why he had intimacy with the king. The king's servant that was way off in Timbuktu. He didn't have an intimate relationship with the king because he wasn't around the king. Prayer gives us that constant communication. God's word is how God speaks to us. And prayer is how we speak to him. You know, if we don't talk to him and we don't allow him to talk to us, we don't have an intimate relationship. We may know him. We may know about him. We may know all about it. There's folks that, man, I can tell you, there's folks in seminaries and in Bible colleges, they know all about God. They can rattle off a whole long list of, they can spit out theology and tell you all these man-made classifications of God's attributes and big fancy technical terms. They know all about God. They don't really know God. They don't spend time with him. They, they read books about God rather than reading the Word of God. And they talk about God rather than talking to God. Those disciples, and to have prevailing prayer, we have to have that intimacy with God. And so perseverance in prayer provides you intimacy with God. It gives you that time with God to get your heart aligned. So to the degree that you know your Heavenly Father, you know how to pray and what to pray for. This is why Christ in, in Matthew 6, 5 gives the, the stipulations on prayer. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. See, this whole passage is dealing, this whole verse is dealing with the hypocrites. And we see this, we see what their reward is. Their reward is the attention of men, They're, because that's their desire. Their desire is not to, to have intimacy with God. Their, their desire is not to connect spiritually with God. Their desire is not to to plead with the God of the universe to, for his will to be done. Their desire is to be seen to men. Their desire is to, to have the approval of men and have the attention. And they get their reward. You know, it, it's, you know, this is so sad. But if you want to find some of the best actors in the world, go to church. Don't go to Hollywood, go to church. The best actors in the world, carnal Christians, hypocritical Christians, the ones that damage the ministry, the Pharisees. They, from the outward appearance, they had the title, they had the position, they had the knowledge, they had the right clothes. They had these eloquent prayers. Man, they sounded good. 
Y'all ever heard somebody that just, you know, they, they just have that gift of when they pray out loud and, and it just sounds good. And I'm not saying that this is always the case. But sometimes it's all a show. Sometimes it's all no different than an actor rehearsing on. <coughs> There's no hard in it. See, if we look at the 12 disciples, we can see a cross-section of any church anywhere in the world. See, there were 12 disciples, the original 12. Eight of the disciples were, were average. You know, if we were to put this in church context, they they showed up most Sundays when they could when it was wasn't too difficult. You know, the weather was nice and they didn't stay up too late. And <laughs> there wasn't anything to distract them. They'd come to church and they'd sit there and they'd nod along. They they even managed to stay awake. They didn't sleep. They um, that's about all. You know, they, they weren't, if it was too difficult, they didn't come to church. If they didn't really get involved in the work of the ministry. That might take too much work. They were just average. They were lukewarm. They were there. They were, they were bought in, but they believed. But then there were three. See, James, Peter, and John. At the Mount of Transfiguration, they go further. They were all in. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, they go further with Christ. And they're all in. But only one of those three was faithful enough to go all the way to the foot of the cross. And then there's Judas Iscariot. One was a devil. And you can take in every church, everywhere in the world, there's a breakdown. You're going to have a small group that is truly faithful. You have a little bit bigger group, but they're all in for the most part. You're going to have a whole bunch that are, they're there, they're, as long as it's not too hard, they're ready to participate. And then sadly, you're always going to have some that are, they're the tares in the wheat. They're the ones that Satan will say, there's always going to be a devil in the midst. And these actors in churches, they're how oh, they're acting in pulpits today. They're acting in the choir. Nowadays we don't have choirs much. They're acting in the, the rows, in the seats. So of course they're acting in prayer. See, if your prayer doesn't prove your faith, your dependence and your intimacy with God, and it's only a parody of real prayer. It's only an imitation. <coughs> if we don't truly connect with God in faith, in total dependence, in intimacy, we're just praying to ourselves. We're praying by ourselves. We're just putting empty words in the air. It's just a show. We may be fooling everybody else around us, or if it's done in secret, maybe we're fooling ourselves. But it's not the real deal. All right. So let's go ahead and we're at a good stopping place for today. So you better wrap it up there for today. Next time, we'll pick it back up by looking at a place for real prayer. If I could have Steve come up. Okay.